Hi everyone, I'm really excited to share how we can work collaboratively with geospatial data to really achieve some insights around some sticky environmental problems. And in particular, I'm going to look at a case study where we look at the rate of mortality post bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef. So to jump right into this, I'm, I'm going to give a bit of, bit of contextual background and then demonstrate the work that we've been up to. So first of all, just to understand a little bit of the challenge, earlier in 2024, we experienced a global coral bleaching event. So this is where the sea surface temperature was getting a little bit too warm for the corals and when they don't like that. And so what tends to happen is that they will expel their symbiotic algae that lives within their cells. And that's that's a food source for them. So if they if they remove that algae, not only do they lose the color, and so we'll see the coral skeletons, but then they lose their food source as well. So the corals can eventually die or they might recover if the circumstances allow. So if you have a look at the map on the screen there, you can see in the red colored dots are the areas that were assessed as having extreme bleaching in a survey in early 2024. Now, what we wanted to do is to have a look at this and see if we can actually dig in and quantify some of this information. So just to get a bit of, bit of a feel for it, underwater, this is what bleached coral looks like. So those really vibrant colors, which can look quite pretty, actually mean that the coral is in a significant amount of stress. Now underwater, you see all of this detail, but one of the challenges that we've had in the past is being able to see this from broad spatial scales. And that's really where drone data comes in. And so if you have a look at this image on the screen here, you'll, you'll see those, those same corals and all the individual colonies in this bleached state. So we're looking at those really, really bright colors. And what we're wanting to do is to see if we can quantitatively map this and then look at the rate of mortality afterwards. So the initial surveys were done in March, 2024. And what one of the challenges is that a lot of, a lot of the time these surveys are really expensive and don't happen for another year afterwards. So we don't really know if these reefs have recovered or if, if the corals have actually died. And in this particular instance, if we look at imagery captured in June of 2024, unfortunately, we can see that there, were, that there was mass coral mortality at this part of the reef on Lizard Island. Now, what we wanted to do is to be able to communicate our findings across a wide range of, range of audiences. And so we published the information that we found, which I'll share with you soon, in the Guardian, we've got a blog out there, we had it on the conversation, there was a press release that went out so we could really reach large audiences here. So from the communities, getting the local news all the way through to global, global papers that are getting this information out for people to really understand and gain transparency about what is happening on the Great Barrier Reef post these major bleaching events. So let's just jump right in and have a look at how we went about analyzing the data and some of the results that we found. So I'm going to take you over to GeoNadir, which is a, a drone data sharing storage and analysis platform. And I'm going to take you all the way into Lizard Island, which is where we were conducting this study. So we're just up on the coast of Queensland, up north of Cairns here. Just going to continue to scroll in until we get a little bit closer. And you'll see up here, we're looking for Lizard Island. So we zoom all the way in. And I'm going to go to right to the tip here. We do have data in other areas, but we're going to start with the story all the way up here. And the reason why we started to do this analysis. So these data were shared by Dr. George Roth from the CSIRO, and he put these data up on the, on the platform, and we saw that these data were available and happened to know that we were going out to a similar area several months later. And so we started to ask the question, well, now that we've got these data that are openly available, which is super, super valuable, what can we do by revisiting that site? and flying the same area again, are we able to detect mortality or recovery? So as you zoom all the way in, you'll see, just like I showed on the slide earlier, you'll see the high rate of coral bleaching. And then I'm just going to bring on top of that, the data that we captured in, in June of 2024. 
So you can see the dates here, June 24 compared to March of 24. And now what we can actually do is just qualitatively assess the differences between those two data sets by swiping one across the other. And that was our first check just to see that first of all, our data are aligned. So if they needed any georeferencing, making sure that they're aligned properly and that we are actually able to detect a difference. Now, what we wanted to do is to do a really quick cut at this analysis to see what we would find quantitatively when we assess these data sets. So initially, we started with three 10 by 10 meter quadrats. So you can see these here. So you can see they're 100 meters squared, so 10 by 10 meters. And we've picked a quadrat in the low, medium, and the high density coral bleaching area. So if you can see these here, these were the areas that we wanted to assess first. Now we have since assessed a much, much larger area because we're looking at being able to publish these results in peer reviewed literature. And so needed that to be a bit more rigorous. But I wanna show you how we went about analyzing these data. So we have a team of five scientists. And one of the challenges that we often find with geospatial data is that people work on their own workstations or desktops. And it's really, really difficult to share that. So we wanted to use this platform to be able to do this in a collaborative and real time way. So let's have a look at some of the stuff that we've done. So let's just take this quadrat as an example. So I've got a 10 by 10 meter quadrat. And what I wanted to do was first of all, just digitize manually the area of bleached coral that we see in this region. So I'm just gonna choose the polygon tool. And by also holding my shift key at the same time, I'm able to manually draw sort of a freehand around here. Now this isn't the neatest way, but I'm just doing this for quick demonstration purposes because I'm also doing with my left hand here, but you can sort of get the gist of what we're trying to do is just to look at all these different colonies. And what I'm, what I'm carefully doing here is I'm allowing overlap between the colonies to make sure that I don't have any gaps. So what we will see is that we're counting some of these areas double, but we'll fix that in a moment. The other thing you'll see that I'm doing is I'm going outside of the area of the, of the quadrat here, again, to make sure that I don't miss anything. Now, just as a, as a bit of an idea, so that's, that's the way we went about doing it, although a little bit more tidily than what I've just done for demonstration purposes here. And now what I wanted to do is to make sure that I get rid of all these overlaps first. So at the moment, you can see I've got four polygons and it's covering an area of 28 meters squared, but we know that we've got some overlap, which we don't want. So I'm just going to conduct a union here and that's going to get rid of all of those overlap areas. And you'll see now I have a slightly reduced area, um, but I don't have any overlaps. Now, the next thing that I need to do is to get rid of the bits that are outside of my quadrat because that's not helpful for me either, but I needed those to make sure that I wasn't missing any. So I'm going to select the mid density quadrat. So you'll see that I have both of those selected and just under the union tool, we also have an intersect tool. So when I run that, it creates for me a new layer. And now if I turn off the other polygons that I was drawing, you'll see that we've nicely chopped that out into the area of analysis. So if this was the total area that, covered, that was covering the bleaching, you'd see we've got 22.63 metres squared, and we've got an area in the quadrat of 99.6 metres squared. So we can work out the percentage in that area. Now, what we really wanted to know was how much of what was bleached actually recovered. So we did the same thing to look at where the live coral was in the June data and then digitize the areas where we could see remaining live coral. Now I just want to jump to show you what it looks like when it's all been done. So we don't need to show exactly what it looks like digitizing all of that. So what you see on the screen now is our three same quadrants and you're looking at the low, medium and high density bleaching for the, for the ones that I digitized. Now, remember I said that we had five scientists working on this. So they were all also coming in. So I was able to share this project with my colleagues. You'll see that I've got one of my colleagues in there at the moment. And I could share that with them. And they were also doing it at exactly the same time. So we had replicates of this. And then we could get the average amount of, of mortality post bleaching. So here's my bleaching data. And then what I can do is then turn on the post bleaching layers here as well. So we're looking at what the area 
was post bleaching compared to the area during bleaching. So for example, the high density post bleaching, we've got 0.43 meters squared out of what was initially bleached was 66.55 meters squared. So we looked at everybody's analysis and then we took an average. And what we found here was that of the coral that was bleached at this part of Lizard Island, 97% of that since died in the three months post the data capture. So these are really, really important findings for us to demonstrate that the spatial data is, is really important to be able to get this sort of information and it's far faster than getting people in the water. By having a collaborative nature of this science, it meant that we had one group that was out there in March completely on a different project to the group that was there in June of the same year. Yet they were able to then collaborate together to build on the projects that they were doing independently and come up with an answer for this. So it means it's a really cost-effective way of doing science as well, because we didn't need to wait for that first group to revisit the reef a year later to get these insights. And also by being able to do this in a collaborative way with real-time interactions with everybody all in the project at once and, and doing the digitizing, we really cut out a lot of that effort in emailing around files and looking at version control and all of that sort of thing as well. So it's really important to have a think about how we how we work with open data and open science to answer some of these really sticky problems that we have in environmental science and how we can look at earth observation data and, and geospatial tools and techniques to be able to answer these questions as well.